I'm John Sundman, author of nanoscopically famous novels, Acts of the Apostles, Cheap Complex Devices, The Pains, and Biodigital. Enough about me. Uh, Paul Berg, Paul Berg, world-famous scientist, recipient of the Nobel Prize in Chemistry in uh, 1980 for his work in the 1970s on recombinant DNA, and convener of the legendary 1975 Asilomar Conference on Recombinant DNA. Uh, Paul's a legendary figure, Dr. Berg, that is, on uh, the advancement of molecular biology from the 1960s up until the present. I spoke with Dr. Berg by Skype uh, earlier this year, and we covered a wide range of topics going back to the history of uh, the early history of work in elucidating the fundamental mechanisms of DNA and uh, his pioneering work on taking genes from viruses and putting them in bacteria, which marked the beginning of the uh, age of genetic engineering that we're now in. And uh, we spoke for about an hour, more than an hour and a half. What follows is an edited version of that uh, conversation. I hope you'll enjoy it. Uh, find more information in the links below and uh, be sure to leave a note. Let me know what you think. A whole bunch of questions uh, to pose to you, and uh, I apologize if some of them are questions you've heard a million times before. But I, I want to talk on the general topic of science and civilization, and especially in light of current uh, trends that I see around the country and around the world where science is being rejected as a way of understanding the world. Um, but of course, I want to ask you about Asilomar and uh, how it looked to you at the time and how it looks all these years later and, uh, and current trends in biology um, uh, from everything from CRISPR to wholesale creation of new genomes. So okay. um, however you want to address any of those questions. Okay, let's maybe start with uh, the historical ones. Okay, going back, and then we'll move forward to get to the present. Does that sound reasonable? Yes, absolutely. Okay, so uh, what specifically do you have, would like to talk about it, about Asilomar? I can tell you a little how it came about, if that's interesting, but you probably know that. Well, I, I'm familiar with it, and I, I think um, I, can, I can summarize that um, for any viewers, I'll just do a little intro. But 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 I'm interested in your attitude to whether it um, it was successful at the time in meeting what you had hoped to achieve, especially in light of all the controversy that came up afterwards. And and uh, and I know people like uh, James Watson said it was a you know uh, it was a mistake to even hold the conference in retrospect. Um, and uh, it seems to me as a non-participant and non-scientist, that, that it was a very valuable thing, and uh, it just happened that you were 40 years ahead of your time, perhaps. Well, I think, uh, as I can detect, uh, the reflection of most um, people is that it was a useful exercise and sort of set a precedent for how to approach uh, similar kinds of problems. Um, <clears throat> And I, I think I have my own reservations about whether every confrontation over a new scientific versus society issue is going to be resolved via that format. But in a particular case, that particular case, and one other that I know of, uh, that approach had been very useful. Uh, I know, I think I know other instances where that approach would not have succeeded in producing a, a, a useful outcome. So why do I think that one? I, I think, first of all, it was an issue that exploded almost instantaneously into the public. It wasn't something that had been lingering for a long time. Uh, there were no strong religious components or, or greatly moral one. It was posed 
as an issue of public health. Are any of the recombinants that people were going to make have the potential for causing serious disease if they escaped from the laboratory? That was the problem that was posed. It wasn't about whether it was ethical. It wasn't about whether it was um, uh, likely to change life forms forever. So it really focused on that issue. And it, it's the success of the thing, I think, emerged from the fact it focused on only one issue. So the, if you look at the proceedings over the three days, they essentially were structured in a way, here's a bit of science that is, would be advanced if we could use the technology. Here are the risks associated with that approach. Here's a second area in which that could be uh, helpful. And what were the risks associated with that one? So essentially it matched risks with progress or potential and that was one way of engaging the scientists, because had we structured it, let's talk about the science for the first day and a half, and then let's talk about the risks. I my guess we would not have been, been even kept the interest of the scientists going <laughs> if we were just going to talk about the risks. So everybody had to think about what it is they wanted to do, and were there any risks? And if there were, how could these be? mitigate it in some way. So uh, I should say that throughout the whole conference, there was the constant problem that everybody defining that what they wanted to do as being perfectly safe, and it was only somebody else's <laughs> approach yeah. that was causing any progress. But over the three days, and particularly, I think, the last night, um, everybody came together because I think Sidney Brenner was particularly articulate in, in, in telling everybody that if we did nothing, somebody was going to do it for us. The government would probably step in. So we had a chance that we had raised the problem, we had articulated and it had potential risks, which we could not evaluate completely. What was the best way forward? Best way forward was the one that we proposed is let's go slowly have guidelines that allow people to be able to follow the, conduct the research in a responsible way, to educate people about what the nature of some of the risks were, and to structure the guidelines so they had a sort of evolutionary uh, status. That is, today we think the risks are such, but six months from now we'll re-examine the issue and, and determine whether those risks are still there, or can we provide evidence that they're less likely and move along? And over a year and a half or so, the guidelines virtually became inoperable. Yeah. But I think what was important, the most important outcome was the public saw that scientists had posed an issue, had taken responsibility for trying to address the issue, had come up with a reasonable proposal, and the public actually was engaged to be able to see that scientists responded responsibly. For example, here at Stanford, we had committees that engaged public people, other members of the faculty who were non-scientists and the scientists to review almost every experiment that was being undertaken. And what was striking was that after a few months people in the public stopped coming right? because they recognized that, in fact, the people who, have, who were engaged in this process were addressing it seriously. They weren't trying to avert, get around the issues, that they were proposing ways in which they were going to essentially reduce any likelihood of risks. So what, step by step, I think we engaged the public in a responsible way. We had a responsible response from the media. You know, we had one-tenth of the attendees were people from the press or related areas. They participated in the conference just as the scientists did. They were free to ask questions, make comments. They were in all the bull sessions in the evenings. Yes, I've spent some time talking with Victor McElhaney. Do you remember him? 
Uh, yes. You're from, the, from the New York Times and then uh, Cold Spring Harbor. Yes. So, for example, the only constraint we put on the people from the press was that they not publish anything or try to write anything during the conference. They were free to write whatever they wanted, all of their reactions uh, as they pleased once the conference was over. And so the relative isolation of a Silomar, this spectacular setting in which that place exists, if you've never been there, uh, all of the foreign people who arrived there were almost overwhelmed by the beauty and uh, of the site and the comedy that existed amongst the people who attended. So there were lots of times to talk, formally, informally, and so on. The, the, the sessions were contentious, for sure, but the evenings were these long-winded bull sessions over beer, when a lot of this debate occurred. And the last morning, when the organizing committee, of which I was the chairman, had to come up with a proposal, we had worked through the night and came up with a series of recommendations of how we might proceed. And we got, I'd say, 95% of the attendees to approve it. Now, Jim Watson, you have to remember, <laughs> Jim Watson was one of the signers of the original so-called moratorium letter. Yes, yes. Okay? Now, Jim backed off because my own cynical view is Jim recognized that this was going to be a big expense for Cold Spring Harbor uh -huh. because he would have to remodel and yeah. outfit most of the labs to, to um, follow the, the guidelines on physical structures in which certain lines of research would go on. So Jim, when he opened, went to Cold Spring Harbor, he set up a tumor, tumor virus institute or laboratories. And he knew that if he was going to continue to work with those things, he was going to have to remodel those labs. And that was going to be pretty costly. That's my cynical view. But, but it's also it, true that the, the, the public in Cambridge, Massachusetts did, as, as he feared, they get a little bit hysterical there for a while. But that was later. That's, that was well past. That all occurred after the guidelines were released, which was approximately six or eight months after the Asoma meeting. And once the guidelines were released, again, the few naysayers at Harvard used the occasion to try to get the mayor to uh, rally behind them and try to argue against, uh, but, but Jim had nothing to do with the Cambridge issue. Uh, Jim was, was opposed to, he and I testified several times to various state committee, uh, uh, Senate committees. Uh, we did several different interviews. We were recorded. We argued both. Before. Jim major contention was that raising the issue was a mistake highlighting the outcome that was a mistake because it all set back cancer research by, he claims, five years. Yep. I think we can make very, very good, strong argument that that was wrong, that did not set back cancer research because the technology was so primitive to begin with that one couldn't carry out any sophisticated kinds of experiments until we learned how to run. I mean, we, we could only walk in the beginning before you could clone anything, before you could identify how to identify clones and so on and so forth. All of that took time when people were developing technology. That technology was being uh, moving forward. And then it became possible for people to begin to try to isolate oncogenes and so on and so forth. I just don't buy Jim's argument. Yeah. So, so looking forward now, but but the, so people had concerns then. They were they were extrapolating, of course, on things that couldn't be done in 1975, but imagining a day, you know, of of, well, f first we have uh, genetically modified crops, but now the the idea of genetically modified people and so forth are is closer and closer to reality, and and that upsets a lot of people, and sometimes they can. Uh, 
discuss it analytically and sometimes it's just pure emotion. Yes. So let me go back to just two points which I think I wanted to finish up on. Okay. So one of the kinds of issues that arose since Asilomar, which are not going to be resolved and were not possible to be resolved by that mechanism. One was stem cells, mm -hmm. stem cells. That issue clearly brought a lot of other issues into the debate, other than the scientific ones. Um, and you could talk, we tried to have several conferences trying to come out with some resolution of how to proceed, and people just talked by each other. There was no way we ever could arrive at the. On the other hand, another example where the, that model worked very well were the people who are doing um, geoengineering, so to speak. Yep. These are the people who are interested in trying to modify climate by introducing things that could directly influence climate. Um, now, there was an issue which is a lot of uncertainty about the experiments. Uh, were those experiments going to have unintended consequences? Um, how should they proceed um, on what seems like a promising idea, but how can you actually test whether it's um, safe or not? So they actually had an Asilomar meeting, and then all the physicists and astrophysicists all came together, and they discussed various types of experiments that were contemplated and what the risks were and so on. So that's a particular example where it worked very well. Um, geo crops or genetically modified GMOs, yep. you could have all the conferences you want. Never could you resolve that issue because it had other inputs, social structures, uh, the way small farms try to protect their interests against big company farms. So in England, where a lot of the resistance were, they all pointed out to us that it was the social structures that were being challenged by, that rather than scientific issues which were being raised. Because all the academies throughout the world said genetically modified crops were safe, they had tested there were many t data, there was a lot of data about preventing spreading into other kinds of crops. But the nub of it was that people basically had this insecure feeling that you were modifying my food yeah. and I didn't have any say in it. And only the farmers are likely to prosper from my putting me at risk. So the whole thing never could be resolved by it any scientific discussion. So it's, it's interesting to see what issues um, are amenable to resolution through Silomar type of um, engagements. But I think uh, we can talk about different ones. Let's see, CRISPR. CRISPR, in fact, started out with the same way the recombinant DNA thing is the person who was involved in the development of the technology raised the issue about whether it was going to be used indiscriminately for purposes that would possibly contaminate the technology for many years to come. So we had a small meeting in Napa of about 15 or 20 people. We discussed the issues and we started out by having a letter published in Science calling attention to the potential issues that arise out of potentially modifying germline genes. And that blossomed into this big meeting that the, was held at the National Academy of Sciences uh, a little over a year ago now. And there it sits. There's a sort of weak moratorium, yep. so to speak, um, but not a real one. So there are people who are going to be trying to develop the technology that ultimately will confront society with should we, can we modify human germline genes uh, and what are the consequences uh, of that capability. So 
there's an issue which my guests will come back to. We'll have a Silma 3, 4, 5, or 6, or whatever the number uh, to be called. Uh, the one you raised is what about people synthesizing genomes from scratch, making tailor-made genomes? We know you can probably do that for small genomes, but getting to anything bigger than yeast, say, for example, which as far as I know has not yet been produced. People have done single chromosomes in yeast. Right. Well, there, there was an announcement, I think, yesterday or today about uh, work in that direction, but it's still another year till they have a complete synthetic yeast. Yeah. Well, but I think they've made a single chromosome. Yes. Yes. So, you know, people made many chromosomes before. They were uh, maintainable in yeast cells. And those were small ones. They were, I'll call them synthetic, but they were just assembled using recombinant DNA uh, to make many chromosomes, and you could propagate those. But trying to make something as big as the existing chromosomes um, this is a formidable task. I'm not sure I understand why, but I mean, why people want to do it. Is it just the Mount Everest ch type of challenge? It's well, there. Let's do it. Well, I read um, uh, Craig Venter's book um, and where he talked about why he wanted to create the first synthetic anything. And it was basically uh, on the principle that if I can't create it, I don't really understand it. So just like the Mount Everest kind of deal, just what will we find out by trying to build the thing? Yeah. So, well, try, what we can find out by trying to build it is one issue. Once you have it built, what's the utility? Yeah. Well, there again, I'm not a scientist, but I guess the idea is that it's, it's just easier to doctor it to, to, to make it do this or do that once you can put it together arbitrarily. So I don't know. Yeah, right now, using CRISPR technology, you can make any modifications you want in an existing chromosome. You can tailor make tailor uh, direct changes to it that uh, can answer many of the questions that somebody would say I could formulate or test by f synthesizing chromosome. So, so speaking of of, uh, of CRISPR and similar technologies that are becoming more and more prevalent and uh, and powerful and, and cheap, do you have any particular concerns about biosafety or biosecurity? That um, I mean, it's easy to find examples of wonderful, beautiful work that's being done, but do you have any concerns about bad things that could be happening with this technology? Well, I think one of the things that's been raised is people actually trying to do it for what I'll call relatively trivial reasons, or as some people call it, cosmetic reasons. Yep. Okay, somebody says, I want my offspring to have the following phenotypic capabilities. The question is, we don't know, in most cases, they're complex traits their complex number of genes, how they interact to produce a particular trait. But put aside all of that, let's say we know that. Let's just say 25 years from now, we'll know every aspect of our genome function. And we'll know the inputs that contribute to a particular trait. And let's assume that CRISPR technology is as advanced to the point where you can make seven or eight modifications simultaneously. Okay, yep. that, we know you can do that now, but let's assume that you know the targets and that you can do it with a, with a fidelity that doesn't introduce any irrelevant changes. Yep. So you produce an offspring that has that favorable phenotype. That's not stable. First of all, there are two things. A, we don't know how the epigenome actually influences traits. Yep. We know they do because we know that environment does have at least a 50% input in terms of particular traits. So the effect environment is not 
We don't know how that acts. And the second thing is it's not stable because in the next generation, unless those genes are all linked on one, one stretch of DNA, they will segregate. Yep. Okay, so you lose the, the very property that you spent all that effort to combine into one, one particular fertilized egg. So I, to me, I just think this whole concern about whether people are gonna to wanna to do it, there's very good reason why it doesn't make sense. And hopefully we can convince anybody who wants to try it to that thing. But the second question is, um, is CRISPR the way to, treat, to eliminate serious human diseases from the germline so that we can eliminate those diseases from the face of the earth? That's, that's the other that's sort of speculation. Yep. So let's take the question and ask, is there any other way to achieve the same aim? And the answer is, yes, there is other way. The other way is very simply taking advantage of the IVF procedure and the capacity to be able to do a genome analysis on every four cell, eight cell stage embryo. Yep. So if you can do single cell, whole genome analysis, you can essentially determine in any at-risk pregnancy or uh, uh, likelihood where the sperm and egg will produce defective embryos, you can eliminate those embryos and you can implant the embryos which are free of the thing. In that case, you have now eliminated the transfer of that gene from the next generation of at least that mating. Yep. So the question is, how many instances are there where you can identify a disease so horrendous and in, incapacitating that could be fixed by CRISPR? And the answer is very, very few. Yeah. And, and the, the, the few that I can think of are so unlikely as not to be a real issue. For example, if you have two people who are homozygous of the same gene. Okay, let's say it's CF. Yep. So each carries a defective CF gene, the other one carries, each chromosome carries a CF gene. They can't possibly produce a normal offspring. Yep. But it's not, so you would have to say, you would have to do germline modification on one or the other's genome before you could allow a mating to allow an embryo carrying the normally repaired gene to perpetuate the line. Yep. That's so unlikely because two people who are homozygous of the same serious disease are not likely to, ready to get to that stage. Okay, so I myself sit there and say, I don't really understand where all the hoopla is coming is that we're going to eliminate serious diseases from our world by using CRISPR. Since well, we can there, there are other there are other approaches to other kinds of diseases, like for example the elimination of malaria. But that that's that's a whole different. Uh, that's not modification of germ lines. That's yeah. just yeah. eliminating uh, the ability of mosquitoes to carry malaria, for example. That's a different issue. That's yep. a different issue. Yep. Okay, but but somatic diseases. Let's take sickle cell anemia, which is already now in three independent trials where they were able to modify the beta globin gene by repairing the defective base pair yep. and, and produce people who are now freed of a sickling disease. So there's lots of single gene defect diseases to work on. Because there, at least you could say, I have a defined target yep. and I do not have to invade the germline all I have to do is be able to fix the stem cell right. that gives rise to the affected cells. So I think we're going to see thalassemia get cured, sickle cell. My guess is even CF, there's a good chance that one could do that. Yep. Awesome. So CRISPR will have earned its spurs. 
yeah. if you will, so, <laughs> by being able to cure a lot of serious uh, defects in children. And and we don't have to change the germline. Yep. Well, let me change the, the, the focus a little bit of the, of the talk now and, and look at attitudes of the public towards science in general. And I'm thinking in particular of the United States Senate, a majority of, of which doesn't uh, acknowledge climate science and uh, looking at the, the rising trend in uh, anti-vaccination uh, views by a lot of the population. Just, it seems like a, an enormous percentage of our, what you would hope would be a civilized, educated society is uh, just turning itself away from, from science. Do you, do you see things that way? Or, and if you do, I'm what do appalled, we do about it? I'm appalled by the extent to which that is emerging. I, I agree. And, and, and maybe, you know, things like some of the, I'm going to just speculate a little bit and say, well, maybe that scientists raised issues about their own science. Let's go back to the recombinant DNA. Opens the floodgates to people saying, well, maybe you guys do do something or can do things that are dangerous. And how do we know that every time you choose to do something that there isn't a good reason to not do it or have serious reservations about it. So I think that we have opened the discussion such to engage the public. They, they know that we ourselves have had doubts about things that we started to do. Uh, you could argue and say, well, why, why shouldn't they? And I'm particularly thinking about the uh, immunization issues. Why do people believe or want to disbelieve the data that says these immunizations did not cause autism, did not cause this kind of aberration. They just, there are religious reasons people uh, sort of um, revert to. Um, but I, I, I don't have an answer. I'm just appalled by it. I'm outraged by it. And when I hear supposedly well-educated people feed that same uh, fear, um, I'm even more astonished. Yeah. I mean, yeah. you know, the whole issue of climate change, especially as we now hear the new head of the EPA who just says, humans are not affecting climate change. Okay. The man, when he talks about that CO2 cannot be responsible for uh, the climate change that we were experiencing and predicting, I don't know, how do you get somebody to that stage of influence that's a total denier of 98% of consistent science? Well, it, it seems to me that, that um, there, there is a colossal arrogance built into their attitude to assume that um, I don't need to go to school, I don't need to study, I can figure it out on my own. And, and, uh, and I think it was Sinclair Lewis said, it's hard to get a man to see something when his salary depends on his not seeing it. Yeah. So, so if, they're, if their success, however they measured it, is, is based on their not being able to see something, I don't know, I, I don't have an answer either, but it... It's, it's deplorable <laughs> and, and it's both deplorable and worrisome because it will lead us in directions which uh, will generate enormous risks. Yeah. I mean, I, 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 it's hard for me to imagine that people who have responsibility um, to turn away from predictions of dire consequences. So, for example, we're going to end up where the oceans are going to rise. I live Every, on an island. So. Huh? Okay, the oceans are going to rise. And so the question is, there are, are there parts of our country that are going to be inundated by that? So, you know, you'd say to yourself, I don't know what the rise would be, but let's say it'll be substantial so that lower Manhattan, parts of it that are now populated with uh, big 
corporate entities and whatever, and whatever, essentially will be affected. So now you'd say, well, maybe, I, maybe it won't happen. Maybe it won't happen. But let's, let's say that there's a probability, if you want to make it a probability, only 20%, I'm going to say it's 80%. But 40% is still pretty worrisome, so why not take out insurance? Yep. Okay, here we are talking about health insurance. We're not talking about climate insurance. Well, I, I think that the... Or, the, or, the, or the immunization thing. What are the consequences of not co immunizing kids and sending them into an environment where they're going to be spreading an infection that's going to affect many, many other people? How can anybody of responsibility condone that? When you look at, at uh, how science is now funded in, in the United States, do you, are you seeing any, any changes um, away from um, use of, of good scientific process for deciding where the funds get allocated? Do you know what I'm saying? Do you, do you see politics intervening in, down to the level of, of deciding which kind of science proceeds and which doesn't? There has always been that. There are, periodically, there have been people in Congress who take it upon themselves to judge the way some of the funding is being allocated. And if it violates their biases, uh, they come in and try to intercede in the, um, in the process. So we remember there was an NSF always had this particular, I forget what it's called, something of the, of the month. Yeah. Announced some interesting project. I mean, for non-scientists to come in and say, this is irrelevant or unnecessary, is to not understand how science has progressed and that so many important breakthroughs have come from non-obvious type of research projects. Well, look so, at CRISPR for one. Yeah, well, CRISPR for one. I mean, if you go back to where CRISPR came from, uh, it was in a dairy, dairy lab, yeah. okay? Somebody who was just sequencing those bacteria they want to use to make better um, sour cream or <laughs> yogurt, okay? Uh, I'm sure that if somebody was doing that project, I could imagine there'd be somebody overseeing and say, what's the use of that? Why is that NIH funding such research? Yeah. Well, I think we have to, every once in a while, we have to gather together the ex enough examples that illustrate how seemingly unrelated experiments or research projects turn up breakthrough. So, so I, getting back to um, the technologies like CRISPR and so forth, it's, it's my perception that we're going to see people who are not in formal laboratories, but just individuals operating outside of institutions, hackers, in other words, trying to do all kinds of things. I mean, there's already talk in, in some communities uh, about uh, uh, ways to use CRISPR and other technologies for biohacking. And uh, I, I just have a sense that we're going to see a, a kind of a recapitulation of the computer virus hacking we'll now see in, in, uh, in, in biological hacking. Do you have any sense of that? I really have not heard anybody raise the issue of sort of biological hacking. It's a little hard for me to see. So if you have an example of something that somebody has proposed as a form of biohacking, uh, lay it out and then let me react to it. Well, so there, there's a big annual uh, computer hackers conference that takes place every year in Las Vegas. It's called DEF CON. And uh, it's been going on for 20 some years now. And uh, people who are interested in computer hacking come from all over the world and share secrets and techniques and so forth. And there's, there's good guys and bad guys and in between guys there and you don't know who's who. Um, but that's where they, you know, people discuss ways to, for example, hack ATM machines to get them to give you money and, and ways to defend against hackers who are attacking ATM machines. But anyway, for the last two years, there has been a particular thread at, um, at DEF CON on biohacking. 
And some people are just uh, looking into modifying their own selves, not their, their DNA, but, but for example, implanting computer chips into their fingertips or even implanting chips into their own brains just to see what they can do to augment their own, their own biology. So it's, it's not inconceivable that, the, that people who are of that mindset will be wanting to uh, modify their own, their own uh, cellular DNA. And also, maybe bad guys will be trying to create bioweapons. Uh, well, you know. Okay, the bioweapons thing is a, a concern that goes way back. Uh, we were charged with being negligent of not having raised that issue in this Asilomar meeting, actually, yep. because there you could easily see that somebody could clone genes from uh, toxin-bearing microbes and incorporate those toxin genes into simple E. coli or other human inhabitants. So those were real risks. But in fact, what we realized at that time is, A, we had no way of preventing that. Nope. Uh, Second of all, there was treaty, which was actually to prohibit uh, major countries from engaging in developing uh, genetically engineered microbes for bio warfare. Uh, and that we, we knew of that, uh, that treaty which existed. Uh, but it turns out you can, for example, we used to joke and say, well, somebody, um, could, uh, oh, I'm blanking on what it is, or the, um, well, let's say a particular toxin gene. Yep. You have a microbe that produces this toxin gene. You might clone that gene, put it into E. coli, and poison the water supply. Okay? But you could have done that with the microbe itself. Right. Okay? So in many cases, some of this fancy genetic engineering was just being fancy rather than preventing uh, that outcome. So, but I think what is true, and you have mentioned it, but there's a whole field that's called synthetic biology. Yep. Which George Church is certainly one of the prime practitioners. But when you think about it, what it is, it's just recombinant DNA on steroids. <laughs> yep. it, what it is, is just becoming much more sophisticated in the way you can assemble genes from different places to construct totally new kind of genomes and therefore impart very exotic properties on the organisms into which you implant these genes. So that's a big field. Yep. Uh, and in, you know, on one hand, I know the people who have been engineering microbes to make biofuel. Yep. Okay. And that's a big field. So that's one way you would say, go for it. I mean, that's utilitarian. On the other hand, you can also make microbes that, uh, as far as I would say, that are very good at synthesizing molecules. Uh, and in fact, I once had a debate with somebody about whether you could actually visualize making microbes that could make commodity chemicals for the future. Yep. Uh, okay. But then you have also the world's ones which have nefarious purposes. So all synthetic biology is the usual problem. You can find good aspects to it, and it carries with it certain kinds of risks. And the only way I can think of it is, is getting it out in the open and dealing with the potential risks in a more direct way rather than just saying, let's ban all synthetic right. biology, yeah. which is the hammer approach. But I think scientists are going to want to talk about their achievements. So if they're doing things that look uh, dangerous, there'll be ways to call on that call the people on that and develop constraints. So I, I'm not so, there are a lot of things that we do that have that dual purpose. Oh, absolutely. And uh, I think all we can do is be aware of the potential misuses 
and try to find ways to mitigate those. How do you feel, um, what is the best way to communicate with the public about such things? I mean, other than having conferences like Asilomar, do you, do you work with science communicators at Stanford? Is there a program in that? Uh, I, and I, I know a person who runs a synthetic biology conference and he's uh, spends a lot of time thinking about how to influence Hollywood to uh, to create uh, entertainment that has a, a realistic and positive spin on yeah. things. Well, you know, I uh, I talk to a lot of student groups. Uh, I get invited to to meet with many of them are undergraduates. Uh, groups, right? I yep. booked for one in April, and I will usually talk about a little bit about these kinds of topics. I also uh, have a sort of standing invitation for annually to talk to a group of non-scientists. These are people who take who come to Stanford to sort of search for what their next career is going to be. Yep. So, so these are all people who have been very accomplished in their career. They have to retire from their thing because that's uh, in business, a lot of requirements are 65. And so the question is, what are these people going to do next? And so there's a program here here at Stanford that brings these people here to spend a year immersing themselves in a university and taking advantage of all the things that they could possibly latch on to. That sounds grand. It's a great program. Uh, and so I meet with them once a year and over dinner. And I talk about some particular topics. So I've talked about recombinant DNA, I've talked about stem cell, I've talked about CRISPR. i got to figure out what I'm going to talk about in the next <laughs> summer dinner time. So, but I, I try to, where, wherever I have a chance to talk about what science is like and what it's like to be a scientist. I've made films. Um, I made a film with a painter, an artist, who's quite famous, uh, internationally known. And he and I made a film on what are the similarities and differences in the creative process in science and in art. Well, that sounds great. And so that's been a fun uh, thing. So, uh, and I've made other kinds of little films that go out into the public, which are playful, and but in part a kind of excitement about what science is about. So, you know, I'm not on a mission that I look for all these kinds of opportunities. You know, I'm, I'm going to be 91. So even to the extent... Well, you're looking great, Dr. Burke. I got to say that. <laughs> uh, to the extent that I'm still active, uh, I can't do everything. <laughs> yep. So I'm involved in a lot of things here at the university. And uh, so uh, I do what I can. I, I gather you interviewed George Church. I did. Yes. So, I mean, he certainly is one of the most aggressive people in trying to push the limits of what, um, right now, of how the CRISPR technology can be used, and in, in areas which I think I just have not thought much about, um, this whole business of uh, malaria being one of them. But, but, He's a very creative guy, and he runs a huge operation. Yep. Uh, and since I never operated on that scale, my lab skit was probably not more than 12 people. Yep. Uh, so when people have 30 or 40 people in their lab, I can't imagine how they manage it. But anyway, he is certainly one of the important ones. And then there's a big group at, at the road. Yes. Uh, they're clearly pushing the the applications, but mostly in scientific things. I think they're able to use the CRISPR technology in ways that were not at all obvious initially, yes. but, but which are mind-boggling today. But, but that's what I think is important, is somebody, I mean, recombinant DNA sort of just opened the door a crack and said, it is possible to be able to manipulate DNA but the way people latched onto the technology and expanded it and into areas where I don't think any of us initially originally 
even imagined. So even at the end of a Somar, I would say at that point, there were a few low-hanging fruit yep. that we could all claim that was doable, but some of which has never yet been completed. Um, and lots of things we never imagined which have come to, to pass. So that's the beauty of science. Yes. That's the beauty of it. It's amazing to, to think that um, uh, just the long trail that goes from one one discovery can lead to something 30 years later. Like like uh, CRISPR did, was starting out researching how bacteria have a primitive immune system to, to deal with viral infections. I mean, who would have guessed that that would have led to, to all these new breakthroughs to, to cure diseases? That was just pure basic research. Absolutely, absolutely. I mean, I think that it could be uh, this generation's poster child for that for that point, making that point. But there were many before. There were yep. many before. Yeah, my, my wife did some of the uh, uh, first work on um, overlapping gene products. So uh, so after Sanger published his work, she was one of the first uh, to replicate it. That's what she did her dissertation uh, on. Uh -huh. So just this very is, basic stuff. But I mean, to think that to go from 1952 you know, Watson and Crick all the way up to the mid 70s and before it was understood that you could have overlapping gene products and so forth. It was just so much basic work to be done. Yeah. I learned something the other day that was rather interesting. We published a paper many years ago. It was kind of a little trivial thing. I don't think anybody paid any attention to it. Essentially, it showed that DNA polymerase could add uh, or that ribo uh, DNA polymerase could add ribonucleotides. Yep. Okay, so you just had to adjust the conditions. We used a different metal ion to, to the catalysis. So DNA polymerase could add a ribonucleotide at the end of a chain. Okay. And later on, Sanger found that little thing and it formed the basis for the sequencing method that he developed. Yep, yep. So there's a kind of thing that we were, what we discovered was just an oddity. Yep. It was really just an oddity, but he made use of it to actually develop something that changed the world. Yep. So, so again, we ought to just compile examples like that so that we can actually um, use it as means for justifying why you can't prejudge any kind of investigation as to its utility or ultimately being important. Right. Every bit of information turns out to be important or can be found and used yes. in certain ways. Well, I think I will uh, let you go. I thank you very much for your time. This has been a lovely conversation. Um, and I really appreciate your perspective and I appreciate your making the time to chat with me.